When your pastor or priest opens up the good book on Sunday, perhaps it's to lead that week's liturgical reading, to share an edifying lesson from Proverbs, to recount a well-trodden story about a familiar Bible character, or to deliver an admonition from one of the epistles. You probably don't expect dark tales of bloodthirsty monsters, primordial demons, or celestial assassins. Even lifelong members of a church or synagogue might be surprised then at just how many fantastical creatures and phantasmic fiends lurk within the pages of the Holy Bible, often hidden by translations that conceal its true nature from anyone who is not a scholar of Hebrew and Greek. We're going to go hunting for some of these creatures. We'll show you where they're hiding and explain the magic that makes them work, as envisioned by the authors of the Bible themselves. Much of the information and inspiration for this video comes from the book God's Monsters by Esther J. Hamori, a professor at Union Theological Seminary. Check the video description to learn more about it. For the Bible's original authors and audience, monsters and demons weren't just flights of fancy. They were real threats that lurked not only in the shadows of everyday life, but in the very throne room of God himself. Stay tuned to learn the truth about the monstrous cherubim and seraphim, as well as the various divine creatures who carry out Yahweh's attacks and the surprising origins of Satan himself. For many people today, the word cherubim conjures up images of children or infants with white togas and feathery wings. Such twee artistic depictions of cherubs, common in Christian art for centuries, have their roots in ancient Greco-Roman artistic motif called the puto, a chubby male infant that often represented the Greek eros or Roman cupid, as it still does today. The artist Donatello revived the puto in the 1400s as a Christian symbol, and it soon became associated with angels and cherubim. We know from the Bible's descriptions and from artifacts found in ancient Israel and Judah that cherubim were very different from their modern portrayal. They were hybrid guardian monsters, a category of magical creature found all across ancient Southwest Asia and the Mediterranean. According to Hamari, the logic behind chimeric monsters lies in the idea that only the fiercest creatures can serve as guardians for the gods. And what could be fiercer than a monster composed from the most powerful parts of other creatures? As guardians, these chimeras were often stationed at gateways, the winged human-headed bulls that guarded Assyrian palaces, called Lamassu, are a famous example. More often, however, hybrid monsters guard the boundaries between cosmic realms. In Egypt, sphinxes guarded temples and royal tombs. In Phoenicia, winged sphinxes were often depicted on either side of thrones, and we find them at the Syro-Hittite temple to Ishtar in Ein Dara. In Greek mythology, the Cerberus, a three-headed dog-snake hybrid, guarded the entrance to the underworld. In Mesopotamia, winged hybrids protected the sacred tree of the gods. In Gilgamesh, the passage to Mount Mashu and Dilmun the Sumerian Eden is guarded by scorpion men. Hybrids with wings in particular were thought to be capable of traversing the different planes of the multi-tiered cosmos 
making them ideal guardians for divine realms. Engravings and other artifacts from Israel and Judah show that cherubim typically had the body of a lion, bird-like wings, and the head of either a human, an eagle, or more rarely, a ram. Their name in Hebrew, Kerub, apparently comes from the Akkadian Karibu, meaning to bless, and may describe their role as intermediaries between humans and gods. In the Bible, the cherubim are one of the very first monsters we meet in the opening chapters of Genesis. After the first man and woman are expelled from the Garden of Eden, Yahweh stations cherubim guardians, a pair of them, most likely, at the garden's entrance to ensure that humans can never again access the paradise of the gods and the sacred tree of life within it. Nothing will ever get past these monstrous guardians. We next encounter the cherubim in the wilderness during the trek to the promised land. God wishes to dwell among the Israelites, so he orders their leader Moses to construct a movable sanctuary called the tabernacle as well as a special box called the Ark of the Covenant. Very specific instructions on the design of both of these things are given to Moses. In particular, the lid of the Ark must have two cherubim made of gold, and the curtains of the tabernacle must have cherubim woven into them. It is only once the finished Ark is placed in a specific location inside the tabernacle that God is able to inhabit the tabernacle. And God's presence is confined to one specific spot above the two golden cherubim. Afterward, when Moses enters the sacred chamber, God's voice speaks to him from the space above the ark between the cherubim. These golden cherubim are signs, says Hamori, welded into their post to permanently ward off any improper human approach to the ark and to that most sacred space above it where God dwells. However, the cherubim are facing inward because as Hamori explains, they're not just keeping the humans out of God's spot, they're keeping God hemmed in. Their job is to prevent passage between realms in both directions. It also seems clear that these golden statues are not just decorations. They contain the actual power of real cherubim, without which God's presence could not be present. Many centuries later, when Solomon finally builds God's temple in Jerusalem, he places two massive cherubim statues, 15 feet tall with 15 foot wingspans and overlaid with gold inside the Holy of Holies, flanking the ark where God's presence continues to reside. The walls of the temple also have engravings of cherubim and both sets of doors leading to the inner sanctuary have carvings of cherubim. Throughout the Old Testament, God is described as the Lord of Armies who dwells among the cherubim. The cherubim are real to the biblical authors and not mere statues. You might be wondering how using golden cherubim statues to establish God's presence in the wilderness tabernacle or the Jerusalem temple is any different from when King Jeroboam uses golden calf statues for the same purpose at Bethel and Dan. The answer is, it isn't. The only difference is that the historical Judahite kingdom, upon freeing itself of Israelite rule, decided to promote the cherubim rather than the bull as Yahweh's symbol. From their perspective, that made hybrid guardian monsters good, and divine bulls statues evil, and it was their faction that wrote most of the Bible. More evidence for the belief of ancient Israelites that cherubim were real creatures come from the visions of the prophets, especially Ezekiel's bizarre hallucinatory imagery, where he describes them as terrifying hybrids with four wings, bovine hooves, multiple faces, and other weird features merging into a chariot to convey God himself through the heavens to his celestial temple. 
the idea that God rides a winged cherub when traveling between heaven and earth is found in Psalm 18. Contrary to popular belief, seraphim have little in common with cherubim. Like the cherubim, however, they are constantly misrepresented in Christian art as angels. Seraph in Hebrew means a creature that burns, and seraphim were magical flying serpents who wielded fire as an analogy to how regular vipers and cobras use painful venom to attack and kill. Seraphim were primarily associated with the desert, and that is where they first show up in the Bible. In Numbers 21, the Israelites are complaining about the lack of food and water during their sojourn through the desolate wilderness. God gets so annoyed that he sends a horde of seraphim serpents to attack his own chosen people. As Hamori explains it, seraphim can exist on a spectrum from naturalistic ones that slither and bite like normal snakes to the more supernatural ones that fly and use fire. Here, we have the naturalistic type. They attack the Israelites with their venom, and the Israelites start dropping like flies. At some point, God relents and instructs Moses to create a bronze idol of a seraph serpent on a pole. Anyone who looks at it will recover from their snake bites. According to Hamori, this is called sympathetic magic, the use of an image to affect the thing it represents. Paradoxically, seraphim were widely regarded by the ancients for their protective and healing abilities. The image of a cobra, called a yoreus, was a common protective symbol in ancient Egypt, and was often included on the pharaoh's headdress, as we see on the famous mask of Tutankhamun. Like the Israelites, the Egyptians associated yorei with fire and believed that they could use that fire to attack one's enemies. The Egyptians also used snake amulets both to ward off real snakes and to protect mummies from the serpent monster of the underworld. Using the same principle of sympathetic magic, Egyptian and Phoenician temple architecture frequently included rows of seraphs at the tops of walls which is probably where the idea of seraphim positioning themselves above the enthroned Yahweh comes from in the Bible. For all intents and purposes, the Egyptian Ureus and the Israelite seraph were the same magical creature, but it was the Judahite version in particular that was thought to have wings. This is evident from the numerous stamp seals from 8th and 7th century Judah that feature the four-winged seraph as their main emblem. Hamori points out that in the religious thought of the ancient Near East, the deity's earthly temple was understood to reflect its actual cosmic abode. The Jerusalem temple contained a bronze idol of a seraph, allegedly the same one raised by Moses to heal the Israelites. And this would also explain why Isaiah's vision of God's throne room in chapter 6 contains flying seraphim. The Old Testament mentions a number of monstrous beings often described as demons, but these are not the fallen angels of later Christian tradition. Instead, we're talking about named divinities who mete out death and destruction, often on Yahweh's behalf. English translations conceal these names by using generic nouns in their place. But Hamori pulls back the curtain to show that the underlying Hebrew text is actually referring to well-established Near Eastern deities. One of these is Devon whom the Jewish Virtual Library describes as a demonic herald who marches with Yahweh to battle. Dever is the personification of pestilence, a walking weapon 
of mass destruction. Psalm 91.3 refers to him as Deborah who stalks in darkness. In this particular case, the psalm is promising God's deliverance from Deborah. That deliverance, however, less like Aslan saving Narnia from the White Witch and more like the time God saved the Israelites from the seraphim serpents he himself had sent to kill them. For in Habakkuk 3, Dever is described as a member of God's battle retinue. This vivid poem describes Yahweh as being engaged in a cosmic war against the earth and sea. God shatters the mountains, tramples the sea on horseback, and shoots lightning arrows in a comprehensive display of his storm god attributes. But he isn't fighting alone. For verse 5 tells us that before him went Dever and Reshef followed close behind. We'll get to Reshef in a minute. Psalm 78 relates a colorful version of the Egyptian plague story in which the dirty work is carried out by various demons on God's behalf. He handed over their cattle to Barad and their flocks to Reshef. He unleashed on them his burning rage, wrath and indignation and distress, a deployment of evil angels. He cleared a path for his anger. He did not hold them back from Mavet, but handed over their lives to Deva. In this case, we see that at least one of the plagues inflicted on the Egyptians was the work of Dever and his special skill set. However, he's much more obscure than his famous partner, Reshef. Reshef was a really popular god in the ancient Levant and Egypt. Due to his widespread recognition, he was known for a number of attributes and possessed diverse methods of execution. One Ugaritic inscription calls him the Lord of the Arrow, while at other times he is known for causing disease, much like Dever. As we have already seen, Reshef shows up flanking Yahweh into battle in Habakkuk 3, alongside Dever, and English Bibles usually translate his name as Plague. When Jerome translated Habakkuk into Latin, however, he called Reshef Diabolus, a devil. And as we've already seen, in Psalm 78, Reshef is the one who brings a plague upon the flocks of Egypt. In Deuteronomy 32.24, God declares that Reshef will devour the idolatrous Israelites, whether that threat is intended literally or figuratively. Being eaten by a plague demon is not how anyone wants to go. And then there's Ketev. Ketev, the demon of destruction, appears four times in the Bible, always paired with another demon. In Deuteronomy 32, 24, he devours the targets of God's wrath alongside Reshef. In Psalm 91, he is listed with Dever as one of the enemies from whom God will rescue his faithful. Dever stalks at night but Ketev attacks by day. Ketev is mentioned again with Dever in Hosea 13, 14, a passage that taunts death and his demonic henchmen. And in Isaiah 28, 2, Ketev is described as a tempest of destruction. Paired with another demon named Barad, Nicholas Wyatt in his article for the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible says these passages suggests that Ketev is more than a literary figure living as a spiritual and highly dangerous reality in the minds of poets and readers. Although there is no reliable mentions of Ketev in literature from that era outside the Bible, Hamori points out that he became a well-known demon in the Talmud and other post-biblical Jewish writings. Next up in our infernal batting order is Hevyon, or Habi. Habi is apparently an infernal god with horns and a tail who appears in quite unusual story from Ugarit. It tells how the high god El apparently got drunk during a feast and saw a vision of Habi, who smeared him with excrement and urine. What a prankster. 
Avi is apparently a Chthonic deity and resides in the Netherworld. Avion is the third demon who appears with Yahweh in Habakkuk 3. Verse 4 says, There was Hevion, his powerful one. He has one other appearance under the name Habi. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 26 reflects on the fate of the dead. He describes the shades of the dead coming back as living corpses, and then he warns the living, Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut your door behind you. It's Habi, for just a moment until the wrath has passed. Hamori believes that wrath here is an epithet for Habi, summoned by God from the realm of the dead to go on some kind of divine mission, and if you get in his way, you might become an unintended victim. Lastly, we have Barad, the god of hell, who is also known to us from the Ebla tablets in ancient Syria. In fact, he was even important enough in their pantheon to receive sacrificial offerings. As we've already seen, he appears in Isaiah 28 paired with Ketev, where he brings a cold hellstorm in contrast to Ketev's hot tempest. Barad also appears together with angels, celestial hosts, and sea monsters as a being invited to praise God in Psalm 148, 8 and he's included in the mythological imagery of God's cosmic battle in Psalm 18. And of course, as we saw in Psalm 78, he is the one who carries out the plague of hell against the Egyptians. Satan is perhaps the most misunderstood of all characters in the Bible. As countless scholars have pointed out over the years, Satan wasn't even originally a name, and in the Old Testament, he is certainly not a fallen angel, the king of hell, or the lord of demons. The misconceptions about him in modern pop culture are too many to count. As Hamori points out, in the Jewish Bible, there is no devil and there is no hell. The word Satan in Hebrew is simply a noun meaning adversary. The first time a supernatural being with this label appears is in Numbers 22. This is the story of Balaam, a foreign prophet of Yahweh who is hired by King Balak of Moab to come and place a curse on the Israelites. Yahweh tells Balaam in a dream that he should accompany Balak, but do only what Yahweh commands. On the way, we get a bit of narrative whiplash when an invisible angel sent by Yahweh blocks the road as a Satan against Balaam. You probably know how the rest of the story goes. Balaam's donkey can see the angel even though Balaam can't, and after a few failed attempts to make the donkey move forward, the donkey gains the ability to speak and protest. Then Balaam himself sees the angel who gives him a renewed warning to do only as Yahweh commands. This angel is not the adversary, but he is an adversary. And as the story is written, he is armed and prepared to kill Balaam in cold blood. It's the story of Job, of course, where adversary becomes a permanent job description. At the beginning of the story, God is up in heaven meeting with his divine counsel. The adversary is apparently part of the council, and when God asks him what he's been up to, he answers, roving through the earth and walking all around through it. You see, while God is busy with the heavenly business, the adversary has his boots on the ground gathering valuable intel for his employer. Hamori describes his job as a divine surveillance system. God decides to ask the adversary for his opinion of God's faithful servant, Job. At this point, the adversary assumes his secondary role as prosecutor and proposes that Job will curse God if his blessings are taken from him. In effect, 
God and the adversary are devising an experiment to see how faithful Job really is. It's important to realize that the adversary is still working for God, even if he takes the other side of the bet. Over the course of this experiment, we learn that the adversary has some remarkable abilities. He can incite people to action, as he does by making the Sabaeans and Chaldeans attack Job's property and servants. The adversary can also control the weather because he makes divine fire fall from heaven, killing more of Job's servants, and he creates a powerful wind that destroys a house and kills Job's children. The adversary is as powerful as he is cruel, but his actions are reined in by his loyalty to God. The adversary's other major appearance in the Old Testament is in Zechariah. The heavenly court is in session again, and this time, Joshua the priest is on trial. For clarification, this isn't the Joshua who fought the Battle of Jericho, but Joshua bin Josedach, the first high priest of the Jerusalem temple that was rebuilt after the Babylonian exile. Anyway, in this courtroom drama, the adversary is again the prosecutor, and the angel of Yahweh is Joshua's defender. At the end of the trial, Joshua is found guilty, but God decides to rebuke the adversary and exonerate Joshua. The case was fixed in Joshua's favor from the start. Hamori calls it spectacular judicial corruption. The adversary is not to blame here. He was only doing the job assigned to him. The final time the adversary appears in the Old Testament, the text drops the THE. It's not THE Satan anymore, it's just Satan. That's his name now, and he's stuck with it. The text is 1 Chronicles 21, and in this story, Satan incites King David to conduct a census of Israel, even though God has expressly forbidden it. This incurs God's wrath, of course, and disaster ensues. In the end, 70,000 Israelites die from a plague because David failed this test. The really weird thing, however, is that the chronicler is retelling the story of 2 Samuel 24, and he makes one significant change. In the original version, Yahweh himself is the one who incites David to conduct the census, so he will have an excuse for punishing David. But in the Chronicler's remake, that act of deception gets delegated to Satan. The presumption here is that Satan is aligned with God's goals anyway, so the Chronicler is putting some space between God and this rather hmm, unfair behavior by having his cruel henchmen do it, much like what happens in Job. Satan becomes a very different monster in Christianity, of course. In later Christian theology, Satan is no longer a servant of God, but an adversary against God. This development is the result of centuries of evolution in Jewish and Christian theological circles, and Satan gets new titles as a result, like the Devil, which we find frequently in the New Testament, and Belial, which is often used in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and yet instances of the Old Testament Satan who serves God can still be found. In Luke 22, 31, Jesus warns the disciples that Satan has obtained permission to sift you all like wheat. It's more or less the Job scenario all over again. Satan is going to be testing the faithfulness of the disciples, and he has God's express permission to do it. We find something similar in Paul's epistles. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul says that God gave him a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble. He then goes on to state that the thorn is a messenger of Satan sent to torment him. The text is quite clear. Paul thinks God is using Satan to hurt him. The exact form that this metaphorical thorn takes is never explained, but it's clear that even in the New Testament times, Satan is still sometimes working for God. Paul also talks about 
turning a specific congregation member over to Satan for punishment and salvation in 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. And 1 Timothy chapter 1 names two backsliders in Ephesus who are supposed to be turned over to Satan for disciplining. We don't know exactly what turning church members over to Satan would have entailed, but it is hard to avoid the conclusion that Satan is being treated as an enforcer who keeps wayward believers in line on God's behalf. It's mainly in the book of Revelation that Satan comes into his own as the devil, a supreme evil being. In Revelation 20, the author predicts the defeat of Satan, calling him the devil and describing him as a dragon and ancient serpent, a clear reference to Leviathan the dragon in Isaiah 27. And yet, a bit earlier in Revelation chapter 2, Satan is doing what he always does, testing the followers of God. The only difference here is that Satan seems to have more autonomy and the testing may even include Satan killing people, which he was forbidden from doing in Job. As Hamori summarizes, The adversary gradually individuates and uses his sadistic skill set for his own purposes, rather than God's, but he doesn't achieve full independence for a long time to come. Satan is still at God's beck and call at several points in the New Testament, and God still becks and calls. Death is sometimes personified in the Bible, and we find his background in the Ugaritic literature of Canaan, where he is called Mot. Mot is lord of the underworld and sometimes represents the underworld himself. He is said to swallow up the death. My appetite longed for human beings, my appetite for Earth's masses. Reads one text. Later Phoenicians believed Mott was the son of Kronos, El, and equated him with the Greek god Pluto, Hades. Mott has the same name in the Bible, and Sheol is his realm. Hamori uses the pronunciation Mavet, so that's what we'll use here. Mavet is more of an equal counterpart to Yahweh, rather than a subordinate or an enemy. The Hebrew Bible is sometimes unclear about whether we should treat Mavet as a personified being or simply the abstract concept of death. But many passages show that Canaanite ideas about Mot still apply to him. Habakkuk states that an arrogant man opens wide his gullet like Sheol. He is like Mavet and cannot be sated. Isaiah 28 describes the Israelites making a covenant with Mavet, suggesting he is a rival deity to Yahweh. However, Mavet can also be a tool in God's own threats, as we find in Jeremiah 9, 21. Mavet has come up through our windows. He has come into our palaces to exterminate the children from the streets, the young men from the town squares. Death remains an imposing presence in the New Testament. We all recognize the image of the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. I looked and there was a pale green horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hades followed with him. They were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, famine and pestilence and by the wild animals of the earth. However, the New Testament image of Death or Thanatos, as he is called in Greek, is far from clear. As we have Paul stating in 1 Corinthians 15, that Thanatos is the last enemy to be destroyed. And a few verses later, he declares that Thanatos has been swallowed up in victory. A reference to Isaiah 25, 8, which says that God will swallow up Mavet forever. Depending on the biblical writer's perspective, death can either be on God's side or against him.
The Old Testament contains a class of nameless ethereal spirits that are capable of infiltrating human minds and influencing behavior. Amori describes them as divine psyops. Like most of the other monsters in this video, the Bible shows them acting only in the service of God. A great example is found in 1 Kings 22, where we are treated to a description of Yahweh and his divine counsel in action. Yahweh is plotting the death of Israelite King Ahab, and he intends to trick Ahab into attacking the Arameans. So he asks his heavenly host for ideas on how to do this. One of the spirits attending this council meeting comes forward with an idea. He will go forth as a lying spirit and give all the prophets of Israel a false prophecy. The plan works, and all the Israelite prophets prophesy to Ahab that he should go to war with the Arameans. Ahab follows their advice and assaults the city of Ramoth Gilead with his ally King Jehoshaphat of Judah. Of course, the battle is a disaster, as Yahweh intended, and Ahab is killed by an enemy arrow. The lying spirit's mission is a success, and all the other soldiers with wives and children who died in the process are just collateral damage. God's evil spirits are also operative in the story of David and Saul. In 1 Samuel 16, King Saul has fallen from Yahweh's favor for failing to kill the king of the Amalekites. Unbeknownst to Saul, God's new choice of king is a shepherd boy named David. In the meantime, God decides to have some cruel fun with Saul. He sends an evil spirit to terrorize the old man, driving him insane. Desperate to help their master, Saul's servants go looking for a musician who can play soothing music, and who do they find but David, who is apparently famous for his musical skills. God's subtle behind-the-scenes manipulation with the help of an evil spirit succeeds in establishing David as a permanent member of Saul's household. God's secret agents are at it again in Judges 9. After the death of the Israelite leader Gideon, Gideon's son Abimelech convinces the people of Shechem to make him their king in a bloody coup that requires killing all Gideon's other sons. Only one son, Jotham, survives. Three years into Abimelech's reign, God decides that it's time for a regime change, so he sends an evil spirit that incites the lords of Shechem to betray Abimelech. The result is a bloody war that finally ends with Abimelech's head is crushed by a millstone thrown out a tower window. The first four verses of Genesis chapter 6 tell an extremely brief and puzzling myth about how once humanity started to multiply the sons of God came down to have sex with women. Their offspring, the Nephilim, were mighty men of old, men of renown. This is followed by the story of Noah's flood, and it's never been entirely clear whether readers were supposed to connect these two things. Later on, Jewish apocryphal books like First Enoch and Jubilees would develop a complex mythology about this incident but for this documentary, we'll stick to what's in the Bible. The word Nephilim is often translated fallen ones, but what it really means is not explained. The Nephilim didn't fall from heaven since they were born on earth. Some interpret them as ancient warriors fallen in battle. Hamori suggests that the term is connected with miscarriages and anomalous births. The Hebrew text says nothing to suggest they were unusually large, but the Greek Septuagint called them giants, the term that described an ancient race of powerful warriors in Greek mythology. Although these Nephilim should have been wiped out by the flood, we see them popping up again in Canaan many centuries later. When Moses' scouts investigate the Promised Land in Numbers 13, they find that it is full of giants called the 
Anakim, which the text explains are the same things as Nephilim. In Deuteronomy, we learn of other giant races who had also originally inhabited the land. There were the Emim, who the Moabites had destroyed, and the Zamzumim, whom the Ammonites had destroyed. We are also told of a giant named Og, king of Bashan, who was the last of the Rephaim. Joshua eventually wipes out all the Anakim, except for those in the Philistine cities of Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. And wouldn't you know it, the next time giants show up, in 1 Samuel 17, they are fighting in the Philistine army. I'm sure you know the story of how David, the young shepherd boy, decided to fight the Philistine giant Goliath himself while he was visiting his brothers at the battlefield. There is another story in 2 Samuel 21 about how David and his mighty warriors had to fight four descendants of the giants during the war against the Philistines. After the time of David, however, it appears that the giants are no more. The topic of giants in the Bible and later Jewish tradition is something we at MythVision would like to revisit in the future. So stay tuned. There is at least one monster in the Bible who was never on God's side. Long before there was a Christian devil, God's primary opponent was the sea monster Leviathan. The tradition of the storm god battling a primordial serpent is an ancient West Semitic myth that can be traced back to Syria and Anatolia during the Middle Bronze Age. In the text of ancient Ugarit, we find incomplete fragments of a tale in which Baal fought a seven-headed serpent named Litan, or Lotan, a name that is linguistically equivalent to the Hebrew Leviathan. The battle between God and Leviathan is closely associated with creation myths and cosmology in the Bible. These passages typically describe creation as an act of combat in which Yahweh had to vanquish the sea monster and the personified sea, which were both potent symbols of chaos. We see that in Psalm 74, for example, where Leviathan is a multi-headed sea monster with additional sea monster helpers. You split the sea with your strength. You shattered the heads of sea monsters upon the water. You smashed down the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food to the people, to the desert creatures. In some passages, the dragon is instead called Rahab, according to Klaus Sprunk's article in the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible. That name might be related to the Akkadian chaos monster called Labu. Regardless, the terms Leviathan and Rahab seem to describe the same creature in the Bible. An oracle in Isaiah recounts the Leviathan-Rahab myth to remind the Israelites of Yahweh's incredible might. Awake, awake, put on strength, arm of the Lord. Awake, as in the days of old, generations of long ago. Was it not you who hacked Rahab to pieces, who pierced the sea monster? God's victory over Leviathan and the forces of chaos was not necessarily complete, however, since Isaiah 27 speaks of it as an accomplishment that is yet to come. On that day, God with his fierce and huge and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will kill the sea monster that is in the sea. The possibility that this ancient dragon remains a potent threat to be defeated at some unspecified future date allowed the author of Revelation to merge the Leviathan myth with his own view of Satan, depicting the devil as a red dragon with seven heads. In fact, the terms dragon and ancient serpent that Revelation uses to describe this monster come straight from the Greek version of Isaiah 27.1. In later texts, Leviathan gets demythologized somewhat. In Psalm 104, Leviathan is once again mentioned by name, but he is no longer a monster to be fought. Instead, he is part of creation itself. The immensity of this monster that God created 
serves to elevate the prestige of God himself. And as we see in the book of Job, Leviathan's power is a potent illustration of man's relative puniness. Can you pull out Leviathan with a fish hook? Can you put a rope in his nose? Will he speak soft words to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him like a bird? Will you spear him, harpoon him, and let the traders haggle over him? Job also provides a remarkable description of this monster, albeit in fanciful and poetic form. I will not keep silent concerning his limbs, his mighty power, and his incomparable form. Who can strip off his outer garment? Who can penetrate his double coat of armor? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth of terror all around. His back is rows of shields closed up with a tight seal, coming one after another so that not a breath can come between them. One is fused to the next. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezes flash forth light. His eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire escape. Out of his nostrils comes smoke, like a basket with bulrushes ablaze. Even the gods themselves are afraid when Leviathan arises. It says a few verses later. This not only reinforces the grandeur of the mighty Leviathan, but also the polytheistic nature of the mythology in which the Bible is steeped. Even though Leviathan may be the most powerful and terrifying of all the monsters in the Bible, the passages that mention him are more reassuring than some of the others we have looked at. Perhaps because, as readers who want to understand these myths, it's nice to know that sometimes God and humanity are on the same side against a common foe. It's also interesting to see a monster who can give God a run for his money. Most of the other demons and fiends who lurk in the pages of scripture seem to have God's approval when they turn their malevolent intentions toward us. Modern readers are used to thinking of unicorns, centaurs, fairies, dragons, vampires, and other unnatural and monstrous creatures as inventions by fantasy writers who aim purely to entertain. In our post-enlightenment society, we know those things are fictional. When we see them in a book or a film, we understand that the story is fictional. We cannot apply that same mindset to the Bible, however. Its authors and its audience believed that hybrid monsters, flying serpents, deadly demons, and the fearsome Leviathan were things that really existed. Whether you are religious or not, reading the Bible responsibly means we have to acknowledge a worldview that is very strange and foreign from our own, one that does not always distinguish between reality and imagination one haunted by monsters that are all the more dangerous, not despite their loyalty to God, but because of it.